Yeah. Okay. Um, so I am here to talk about how you and open data can mean better cities. So let's break down that equation, starting with you. You all are here. Welcome. It's awesome to have you. Uh, let's jump ahead to the second part, open data. What is it? So open data is data that is freely and ideally easily accessible, that holds little to no restrictions in terms of how you use the data, what you do with the data, how you go on to share the data. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically today about government open data. And it's important to remember that as citizens, we are owners of the government. And therefore, we have a right to the data that the government produces. Uh, this data can be very valuable, especially when we think about it in terms of cities. So open data can help us uh, find and answer questions about our cities. It can help us uncover and solve puzzles and problems within our cities. It can help us spark conversations about important topics in our cities. And I know this because it's kind of what I do. Um, so hi, I'm Kate. Um, I love data. I love cities. I have a website, DataLens DC. I also like penguins. Um, on DataLens DC, I analyze and visualize open data about my city, Washington DC, to tell its stories, show its trends, highlight characteristics of the city. Um, I am also co-captain of Code for DC, which is a volunteer organization, part of Code for America, where you can use data and technology to make the city better. So I'm really passionate about open data and what it can do for cities. Let's walk through a few examples of that. So open data can help us understand our nation and our communities. This is a map from the Washington Post. It was one of their top visualizations of 2016, and it shows the changing demographics, the changing racial makeup within America, and it uses that as a backdrop to explain the changing political environment and the most recent election outcome. Because when we understand our communities, when we understand kind of the people that make up our communities, we can help explain the trends, the social and political trends that are happening around us. And so this is something you can do at a national level. You can also do this at a more local level within your own city. So uh, this is a series of maps that I made about how race, income, and age have changed in different DC neighborhoods across the past decade. Uh, the darker the blue, the whiter, the wealthier, and the younger that neighborhood has become. Uh, these are factors that when put together, uh, we often think of as gentrification, a hot topic, a uh, much used term. When we bring data to discussions like gentrification, we can help to understand where gentrification is happening and what that looks like. You'll notice, I'm going to jump off camera for a second, that there is one neighborhood here, here, and here, Navy Yard, that is the darkest blue in every single map. And Navy Yard has seen an incredible amount of change in the past decade. There are, there's been an influx of new residents, generally wealthier and whiter than long-term residents. Um, there are many new apartment buildings, there are rising rents. When we bring data to these discussions, we can help identify where social phenomenon like gentrification is happening, and we can start to have discussions about what we can do to help the impacted communities. One of the things that I love about open data is it's something you can do too, and you can do it starting right now, because there are many different tools uh, at all skill levels uh, where you can jump in. For any given open data project, it's going to be finding, getting that data, analyzing that data to find your story, and then visualizing it to communicate your findings. Um, and this is something that you can kind of pick and choose where you want to start based on your skill level. For a complete code newbie, that might be as relatively straightforward as downloading the data from a website, pulling it into Excel, and then visualizing it in a point and click technology like Tableau or Carto. Um, but you can get a lot more technical with it. You can use an API to dynamically connect to the data and pull it into a language like R or Python uh, to do more complex analysis. And then you can visualize it in one of those languages or in JavaScript, making anything from a bar chart to whatever the fanciest, latest New York Times visualization is. Um, I'm not going to go into 
what every single one of these things are. Maybe they're new words to you and that is okay. That is why I love the Codeland Cheat Sheet. I have definitions and resources for all of these foreign terms uh, to help you figure out where is best to get started for you. Uh, so finding open data, where does it live? Um, so the first place you're going to look is data.gov, which is the federal government's open data repository. And here you're going to find everything from the um, social characteristics of a population, how people get to work, where people live, unemployment rates, business patterns, economic data. Um, there is a lot of data here. But even though that over 190,000 data set seems like a big number, this is actually a very, very tiny number. Um, the federal government has so much more data than that. And so open data is really a movement that is in motion. There's a lot that we can do with open data today, but there's also a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of pushing governments to open up more data and uncover more stories that are not currently being told. So we can understand our communities through open data. We can also inform policy decisions. So this is an interactive data visualization tool that was built by the volunteer group DataKind DC. And what it does is it puts together lots of different data sources to help policymakers better understand how you can support children and families in different um, areas of the city. And this is important because historically, data has not been used um, a lot to inform policy decisions, but there's a lot of value there to make policy, de policy decisions have more impact and improve our cities. Even when looking at a simple question, like how, a relatively simple question, of how can we improve um, school attendance rates, you don't just want to look at school attendance rates. You also want to look at all of these interconnected social issues that feed into that, like poverty rates, like healthcare options, like um, crime rates and housing. And so with tools like this one that DataKind built and actually has since been replicated in many different cities across the world, you can put all these data sources together to give a better idea of how all these social issues interconnect. Now this data uses federal data. It also uses data that is um, created at the city level, so by city governments. And your city most likely, hopefully, has an open data portal. Um, this is the U.S. City Open Data Census, and it is a uh, kind of a repository and a ranking of over 100 American cities and their data portals. Where we are right now, New York, is number six. It also gives you an idea of the type of data that you can find on these open data portals. Um, so crime data um, is a big one. Spending, budgets, public transportation, 311, or service requests. Um, these are all kind of big bucket um, open data types that you can find in your um, city's open data repositories. There are also like fun one-off random ones. So one of my favorites is that Austin has a data set of every person who's called into the city to report that they have found a lost pet. And so like if you are a person that has lost your pet, this is such a great data set to make open. Um, so there's a lot to be found in cities open data portals. Once again, just like data.gov, there is a lot of work to be done because that number all the way up at the top percent open is only 35%. So there's a lot available today, but there's so much more that we can do to make more available in the future. So open data, it can uh, help us understand our communities, it can inform policy decisions, it can also challenge the way we think about a social issue. And so this is a project called Million Dollar Blocks from Data Made Co. And what they're doing here is really flipping the way that you think about crime. Traditionally, when we map or visualize crime, it is individual data points of where crime has occurred. And that tends to perpetuate the idea of focusing on the outcomes of crime and the individual aspects of crime. What Data Made Co. has done is they have mapped down to the city level how much the government spends on incarceration um, for people that live or would have lived on these city blocks. And there are in fact blocks in Chicago where the government spends 
over a million dollars on incarceration for those residents. And so instead of looking at these individualized criminalized acts, they're looking at the com other communities that are also affected. So where a significant number of people are no longer in their community, where the government is spending more on incarcerating people on that block than maybe providing the social services that are needed. Um, so this is a great example of using open data to not just inform, but also flip the way someone might think about a social issue. So this data um, did not come to Data Made Co. easily. They had to FOIA for it, which means that it was not open data. They had to ask um, the state of Illinois to release that data to them. And when they got that data, I can promise you it was messy data. Um, because local data um, does not have a long history of being used for research or policy uh, in the way that I'm talking about right now. It can often lack the infrastructure for accurate and clean reporting. There are some city agencies that still collect data via fax. Um, so there's often quite a bit of work that needs to be done. I um, recently did a project where I mapped out all the new construction in DC by what type of construction it was. So single family home, duplex, large apartment building. And to do that, I had to uh, code in and tell the computer that single family home was the same as SFH, was the same as one fam home, was the same as house, you get the idea, et cetera, et cetera. This is messy data, but what can be exciting about working with this messy data is I promise you, I was the first person to make that map. And Data Made Co. was the first group to make that map for Chicago. So open data is not perfect, it is messy, but there's also a lot of opportunity for you to jump in and do something that nobody else has done before and tell a story that nobody has told before. So. Open data can help us understand, it can help us inform and challenge the way people think. It can also hold government accountable. So ideally, we want the government to work well and work well for us. That is not always the case, and open data can help us uncover when it is not. Local blogger Iquant New York uh, was looking through parking ticket data, and he found that the city had actually been systematically ticketing legally parked cars for millions of dollars a year. So there was a um, type of ticket that was at one point illegal, and then policies changed. It was no longer a parking ticket type, but cops just kept handing it out to the tune of millions of dollars a year. Um, and when this was found out, it got a lot of press. There was a lot of um, commotion about it in New York, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, the New York Police Department was very responsive in terms of um, kind of listening to this feedback and making sure that it didn't happen in the future. Um, but so open data can be great, not just for understanding our communities or making change within our communities, but making sure that we are working well with our government and government is working well for us. This is an example of an anomaly in data. Um, you don't expect when you jump into parking ticket data to find illegal parking tickets in mass. Um, and that's a great anomaly, but it's important to remember when you're working with open data or any data that anomalies are not always findings because data is shaped by the people who create it and you should consider data to be just as imperfect, just as opinionated as its creators. Um, so when you're working with any data set, there are always a few questions that you should be asking. One is who is collecting the data and why are they collecting the data? What are their motivations? So for instance, this current political administration um, is not particularly friendly towards immigrants and Muslims. This means that when census comes around and asks you to report your immigration status or your religion as they might in any given census form, people might be less willing to report that because of the motivations of the current administration. So it's important to think about why that data is being collected. It's also important to think about how that data is being collected. So um, there are a number of city projects or um, civic tech projects that collect data via smartphone apps. And if you're collecting data through self-reporting of people putting it in a smartphone app, then you are um, probably leaving out a significant subset of the population that doesn't have a smartphone or isn't going to think to use their smartphone in that way. You should also say, mm, is this data funny? And if it is funny, like, 
Why? Because it sometimes can be a true anomaly, like um, the New York Police Department is handing out tickets that they shouldn't be, but sometimes it's just the way that the data was designed. So I was looking at the year that every single home in DC was built, and if I just took the data as fact, I would conclude that 1900 was a boom year for home construction in DC. The line graph would be like 1900 and then like nothing else. Um, that's not because 1900 was a boom year. That's because uh, 1900 is what the administrators put in when they know a house is old, but they don't really know how old. <laughs> so when you find something funny, um, don't necessarily take it as fact. Dig deeper and if possible, talk to the owners of the data set to understand why that might be the case. So open data, as I've said, um, is very much in motion. And it is something that you can get into and even make something new that nobody else has seen before now. And so this is something that you can do on your own. Check the cheat sheet for a ton of resources. It's also something that you can do within a community because there are already a lot of people that are very involved and excited about what can be done with open data. So for your city, uh, check if you have a Code for America Brigade. Check where your nearest Datakind chapter is. Go to meetup.com and just search like open or data or code for, and you will most likely find people that are just as excited about this as you are or you should be. Um, so open data, it is not perfect, it is not messy, or I'm sorry, it is definitely messy and not perfect, um, and it is hard, but there's also so much that can be done with it and so much opportunity for untold stories to be brought to life. So open data is a method, it's just a tool that we can use for good to improve our cities. Open data allows us to raise and answer questions about our cities, but it's important to never stop questioning the data. And that is it. If you have any questions, I am Data Lens DC. Come find me. Thank you. Okay. Great job. So keep in mind, this is the kind of stuff that's really important, right? We want to be working on projects that are actually directly helping our neighborhoods, our communities, our cities.